So these are to look at this, this, this question forces you to look at the equation and just put the pieces together, really. What I see here, I have sodium and bromine. Bromine is there, sodium is not there. So I need something with sodium, and there's an iodine there too. So I need sodium iodide. Sodium iodide. If I put this one here, let's check if this is correct. Two times sodium gives me two sodiums. Two times iodine gives me I2. So this is a balanced equation. You know, this is really like a little puzzle. This is a puzzle, I think, that falls within our human capabilities. Right? There's nobody that is uh, so challenged that you cannot solve this, this puzzle. So you, the only thing is to overcome your resistance for a chemical equation. That's it. As soon as you take that step, then you can just solve this problem. Let's do this one here. What's going on? Y. I just have to fill out what this Y is. I see here uh, hydrogen, sulfur. Sulfur is here. Hydrogen is there. I see also oxygen is there. So oxygen is missing. Okay. So this, this is most likely an oxygen. So let's say this is O2. Let's see if I put O2 in there, if I actually have balanced the equation. 3 times O2 is 6 oxygens. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 plus 4 is 6, so that means 6 oxygens. That's right. The other ones is 4 hydrogens, 4 hydrogens, and 2 sulfurs, 2 sulfurs. So this is balanced. This is balanced. OK, so make sure you're just comfortable with these equations. They're little puzzles, and uh, they, they can be solved. All right, now let's do this, limiting reagents. So this is, this is kind of a nice illustration because it's a visual illustration of the actual problem. Sometimes it really helps if you take expressions from the abstract, which is a piece of text, into something that is actually completely an object. You see here molecules, the molecules will interact. And this is the reaction that we're looking at. This should be an arrow. This is H2 and O2. Those are these guys. So the, blue, the, the red ones are the oxygens. The gray ones are the hydrogens. And they form water. Each water has one oxygen and two hydrogens. So if I want to make a, a water molecule here, I need at least two of these hydrogens and one oxygen. I see one, two, three, four, five, six oxygen, so I could tentatively make six water molecules, right? I count six oxygens, I can make six water molecules. Okay, and that means if I, if I can make six, I, I need for each water molecule two hydrogens. So each hydrogen molecule contributes two hydrogens. So if I need six water molecules, I need six of these pairs. One, two, three, four, five, six. So if I use those six, plus those guys, I have these two left. So what is the situation after the reaction happens? Choose from this. I just determined that if this react reacts, I can form six water molecules, okay, out of three O2s and six H2s, and then I have two H2s left two hydrogen molecules left. They will not react because they're running out of red spheres. So this one is not correct because I have an excess reagent, which is H2. This one is also not correct because I said I can make six. This one makes three, also not correct. Look, this, this guy here can still react. This oxygen can react with this guy, the other oxygen with this guy to form water molecules. One, two, three, four, five, six, plus two hydrogens, this must be the right one. Okay, so again, uh, it is basically a puzzle. It is just little spheres that click, and you just have to determine how many can you form and what you have left, what you have left in the pot. That's, that's the sum of Okay. Now let's look at this. This is an interesting one. A sample of a compound that contains chlorine and oxygen. So this is a compound that has two elements in it. CL and O, nothing else. It will react with an excess of H2. So this is the excess reagent. The other element, the other compound that's unknown at this point is the limiting reagent. And they will produce two products, HCl and H2O. The quantities are given in grams. Determine the empirical formula of the compound. Now, if you read this for the first time, you may say, what's going on? 
how can I determine the empirical formula for this piece of information? That's the first response. Second response is, okay, let's, let's first look at that. Let's, let's see what I have. You want to visualize this problem, okay? The way I visualize it, I'm going to write a chemical equation. I, I don't know, I'm not sure what happens with this error. I'm sorry. It should just be an error to the right. <coughs> so, apparently there's a compound that contains Cl and O, but I don't know, I don't know the substance because it's unknown. That's what I have to determine, right? So I call it X and Y. I know it reacts with H2. I also know there's a lot of H2, so H2 is not a limiting reagent. If this is a limiting reagent, okay? It produces HCl and H2O. Okay, so that's step number one. Then I have to determine apparently what this X and Y is. How do I get that? Well, let's have a look at this, at this problem a little closer. I see that each mole of Cl, X, O, Y can produce how many HCLs? If there is X, if there's X times Cl in there, if I have one mole of this, I can make X mole of HCl, right? Because each chlorine gives rise to one HCl mole. So if I have X chlorines in my, in my compound, I can make X HCLs. <coughs> Same for oxygen. Each water molecule has one oxygen. The oxygen must come from this. It's not about the source. So if I have Y oxygen atoms, I can make Y waters. What about the H? Well, I just said, don't worry about H. There's enough H to take care of this. The limiting reagent is this. So the amount of HCl and H2O is determined by this compound. That means I can make X mole of HCl, Y mole of H2O. All right? Now, that is, that is almost already the problem because, uh, almost the solution to the problem, because I have, in principle, the quantities in moles of these guys. It's given in grams, but I know by now that I can convert grams in a flash into moles, okay? By dividing by the moles. So that, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see how many moles of HCl did I generate, how many moles of H2O did I generate, the ratio between the two should be the ratio between x and y. Okay, that's what basically what this line says. If I determine how many moles of HAL I generate, how many moles of H2O I generate, then I know the ratio between x and y. And the ratio between x and y is the empirical formula, right? Okie dokie, let's do this. So what I have to do is I have to calculate how many moles of this I have and how many moles of that. That is something we can do, okay? Grams converting to moles by dividing by the molar mass. That's your conversion factor. You don't know yet that you have to divide. You can always do this conversion and check the units this has to cross out. So this conversion will give you the number of moles of HCl generated. I find 6.3, 6.4 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of this compound. Let's assume everything happens in water, and this thing here is uh, hydrochloric acid. How about the other guy? Um, okay, so this HCl corresponds to this many moles of chlorine atoms, right? Because each molecule has only one chlorine atom. So this is the, the amount of chlorine. All right? This is the quantity of H2O. I quickly convert that to moles by dividing by the molar mass of H2O. This is a division, but I get is 2.24 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of H2O. Each H2O molecule contributes one oxygen. That means I have 2.24 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of oxygen. Okay. So this is then x moles of this, y moles of that. So this is x, this is y. I can calculate on the ratio between the two. Okay. So that means I can find the empirical ratio between chlorine and oxygen. Chlorine I have the quantity of, oxygen I have the quantity of. The ratio between the two is the ratio between the subscripts. How many moles of Cl do we have relative to the amount of moles of oxygen? So if I, if I divide one by the other, let's, let's just put oxygen on top. Doesn't matter which one, right? Just choose one. Oxygen on top, divide that by the amount of moles of chlorine, 
you get a ratio. The ratio is 3.5. That means for each chlorine, I have 3.5 oxygens. Right? For each chlorine, I have 3.5 oxygens. That's, the, that's what this calculation says. We also know that in the empirical formula, we don't have fractions. It should be an integer. So it's not close to an integer number. Is that a problem? Not necessarily. Okay. I can just multiply it with a number so that I can make an integer. So let's look at that. I have here for each one Cl 3.5 oxygens. That's what I just determined. For each one Cl, for each one mole of Cl, I have 3.5 moles of oxygen. If I multiply this whole unit by 2, I get this. Cl2 O7. That is the empirical formula. It's not the molecular formula yet, but that was not the question. The question was determining the empirical formula. And the answer is right. Okay. So this is, a, this is a slightly different question, but it deals, again, with the same kind of thinking. How many atoms do I have? How many molecules do I have? And how do they relate to one another? If I have this much of this, how much do I have of the other one? That is the kind of thinking that we're applying here all the time. Question. Yes. Why do you multiply it by uh, two? You multiply. Okay. The question is why do I multiply by two? Because an empirical formula should give you the subscripts in integers. This is not an integer. This is three point five. What you have to do then, you have to multiply it with the lowest multiplier that gives you an integer. And that is what we do here. The lowest multiplier is 2, because 2 times 3.5 is 7. That is an integer. And in the process, I have a 2 here as well. The empirical formula is CO2, O7. Yes, another question. In your previous slide, yeah. how would you figure out, you said that there was 2.24 um, times to the negative 2 moles of H2O, which was also equal to that many moles of oxygen. Yeah. How many moles of oxygen? Well, for hydrogen, so for hydrogen, I said hydrogen is an excess. So in this case, I really, have, I really don't have to worry about the hydrogen. But for each one molecule of HCl, I need one atom of H, one hydrogen. For each molecule of oxygen, for uh, of uh, water, I need two atoms of hydrogen. So it depends on if you look at this guy or this guy. Okay, so they have different ratios. You need more H than you need oxygen and Cl. But fortunately, there's an abundance of H's in the plot, so I don't have to worry about it. The question is not about that. The question should be about that, and then we just look at how many H's we have, for each one we generate, and how much we need, and how much H we have consumed. You can do that calculation as well. OK. So let's do the following. Another reaction, remember these Typos are arrows. C6H14 is converted into C2H4. That's a reaction. There's also other stuff that I don't have to worry about. Okay. Basically, this, this means that uh, I have one mole of this that is converted into one mole of that. The ratio is 1 to 1. If the yield of this process is 42.5%, what mass of this starting material, which is called hexane, must be there to produce uh, 481 grams of the product, which is called ethylene? So, in other words, your boss tells you, I need from you 481 grams of ethylene. Okay? And he also tells you, look, this reaction is not very efficient. The efficiency is exactly 42.1, 42.5, sorry. And I want you to determine how much hexane do I need to work. Can you give me that answer five minutes? He said, ah, I can do that. Come on, I need only three. All right, so what you do is this, OK? You would like to know how many moles of the product do I need? How many moles of product? Again, grams, you want to move away from quickly converting grams always to moles. So you know something like a countable number, which is moles. 48. Well, 481 grams divided by the molar mass of ethylene, okay, which is uh, 28.05, says 
70.1 moles of ethylene. Your boss apparently needs 17.1 moles of ethylene. That's what he needs. Okay? So that means if you have 17.1 moles of ethylene, how much starting material do you need? Well, the reaction says it reacts one to one. One mole of hexane, the starting material, the reagent, produces one mole of this. Okay? So, if this reaction were to be 100% efficient, you would need 17.1 moles of the starting material because it reacts one to one. 70.1 moles in, 70.1 moles out. Okay? However, the efficiency is 42.5. So you have to take that into consideration. Apparently, you need more than 70.1 because the efficiency is rather low. So, how do you do that? Okay, so this is what I just said. So, take into account the yield. The yield expressed in a fraction times the amount that you need will be 17.1 moles. Okay? You need 17.1 moles, that should be the outcome. Okay, you need 17.1 moles, but you need to put more in because you multiply up something that is smaller than one. Right? So the fraction corresponding to this, to this percentage is 0 0.425 times the amount that you have to put in should give you the amount that you have to give to your supervisor. So that means that the amount that I need, I can quickly calculate 17.1 moles divided by this fraction, 40.2 moles is the amount you have to start with. <coughs> now, this is the amount of moles. The question also says I need it in <coughs> grams. So what you have to do is you have to multiply this by the molar mass to get the amount of grams of hexane. Is this step clear? Does that make sense? All right, so the multiplication of the molar mass you can do for yourself and then you have the answer. So we just move on to this. This question. This question is the same kind of question, but the phrasing is a little different. Now, don't be shaken by this, okay? It is again the same kind of thinking. And the reason why I like this example is because it forces you to really think of, about these things as countable objects, some of this, some of that, they react, how much react, and so forth. Okay, so here's another reaction. Methane reacts with oxygen, combustion reaction of methane, right? CO2 and 2H2O comes out. I have to determine the number of excess reagent, so excess reagent means what is left in the pot after this reaction is over. Okay? How many do I have in the beginning? Well, it says I have 17 molecules of methane and 142 of oxygen. The funny thing about this question is it doesn't say how many moles you have or how many grams you have. It says how many molecules you have. Okay? But that is not a problem. That's the same thing. The number of molecules is just the number of molecules. Whether they specify a, an actual number or in moles, it doesn't matter. You're ready to take the numbers. <coughs> okay, so what I have to do is to determine which one of these reagents is the limiting reagent. In order to do that, I'll play the same, the same trick as before. I want to know what is the mole ratio between these two guys according to the equation, the balanced equation. It says you need two moles of oxygen for each one mole of methane. And that means the ratio of 0.5. If you put methane on top, the ratio will be 0.5. The next thing I'm going to do, so this is the mole ratio. Mole ratio. I want to determine the mole ratio that I actually have. Again, the number of moles is not given. The number of molecules is given. But what is a mole? A mole is a number. It is 6.05, so 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Right? So I can, you can convert this to, to moles if you want. You multiply this by moles, by a mole number, this by a mole number, but the ratio will change. Right? Because if you multiply this by a mole, this by a mole, and you divide them out, it's still the same. The ratio is determined by the proportionality between the two. Whether you have a mole of it or just a countable number of molecules on your fingers, 
the ratio is still the same. So I can determine the mole ratio simply by dividing the quantities of these numbers, of the, the number of molecules that I have. Okay? Uh, so let's just move on with this. So 70 molecules of CH4, 142 molecules of O2. So this is what this is the actual mole ratio, not given in moles, but in just molecules, because the ratio between molecules and the ratio between moles is the same. Okay? I can convert this to moles if you want, doesn't matter because you convert also this one to mole. The ratio between the two is 0.49. 0.49 is a little bit smaller than 0.5. That means the numerator is the limiting reagent, i.e. the molecule of one drug first. You will burn through the 70 sooner than you burn through the 140. Okay, so this is smaller than 0.5. That means CH4 methane is a limiting reagent. That means the other guy is the excess reagent, okay? Which is O2. That means I have something left in the pot after the reaction has completed. Okay, so how many molecules of oxygen did react? Same kind of calculation. 70, mo 70 molecules of methane were there. That's the limiting reagent. I will convert the number of reactive methane to the number of reactive oxygen through the mole ratio. Okay? Two mo molecules of oxygen for each one molecule of CH4. That's what the equation says. That's the ratio between the two. For each one molecule of methane, I need two molecules of oxygen. So each one molecule of methane, two molecules of oxygen. This one goes at the bottom because I want to cross this out. I want to go to the number of molecules of oxygen that has to react it. 70 times 2 equals 140 molecules of oxygen have reacted in this uh, process. Okay? So, how many do I have left? Yes, you had 142 minus 140, two molecules left. That's the answer. Now, mind you, this is exactly what we did before. Previously, we did it with quantities expressed in moles. Now we do it in the physical number of molecules. But it's exactly the same because you, you, you work with ratios. You work with ratios. So the arithmetic is exactly the same. I'm going to do another one which is virtually the same, just to get used to this. The same kind of question, a different reaction. This is also a combustion reaction. It's a different kind of molecule, but the arithmetic should be the same. Okay? Calculate the number of excess reagent molecules after this reaction has proceeded. I'll do the same thing again. First, the mole ratio according to the equation. The equation says two moles of this reagent for each 15 moles of oxygen. That ratio is 0.133. That is what I call the balance ratio. The ratio stipulated by the balance chemical equation. Then I want to see what I actually have. What is the ratio of the chemicals to reagents that I actually have? Well, here are the numbers that you actually have. So I'm going to say, do the same kind of calculation. 74 divided by 585 equals 0.126. This number, less than that, that means the numerator is going to be my limiting reagent. Okay, so C5H10 is the limiting reagent. From the limiting reagent, you can always determine how many molecules have reacted. All the limiting reagents react, and when the limiting reagent reacts, it takes with it, in this ratio, the oxygens. That means that you can calculate how many oxygens have reacted in the process. So that conversion is, again, number of molecules of limiting reagent is reacting and takes with it for each two of this 50 molecules of oxygen because that's the mole ratio of the two okay so 75 74 molecules of this reagent reacts in this ratio each two molecules reacting takes with it 15 molecules of oxygen that means 555 oxygen molecules have reacted. The conversion here is from number of molecules of C5H10 
to the number of molecules of O2. So O2 goes on top, this guy's go at the bottom. This is what we always do when we convert from one quality to the next. How many did I have in the beginning? 5, 8, 5. This many have reacted. So 5, 8, 5 minus this, 30 molecules of oxygen are left. They cannot react. Why? Because there's no other reagent anymore. It can't well, continue. Okay, I think we catch my grip. Uh, I'll do one more of this, and then we'll do a uh, the final cleaning searching exercise. Okay, so we'll do it now quick. Another reaction, same question. I like repetition because it really gets you into the mood. And these, like I said, this is all this is all about fun. Okay, so another compound reacting with uh, nitrogen monoxide, producing these two compounds. And again, I have to calculate the excess reagent. So, key is the terminable limiting reagent. What do you do? You look at the mole ratio or you look up to the chemical equation. 2 to 10. That means point 0.2. You compare that to the actual number that you have. Okay? That is this number compared to that number. Whether the number is stipulated or given in grams or <coughs> moles or number of molecules, it doesn't matter. It can give you a ratio, right? Grams always have to be converted to moles first, and then you pick the mole ratio. <coughs> the number of molecules, the number of molecules is also the mole ratio. This number divided by that gives you 0 0.182, sorry, 181. That is less than 0.2. That means numerator, again, is the equilibrium reagent. We have a lot of numerators here, but uh, there's no reason why the numerator is always the limiting reagent. It could have as well been the denominator. In these examples, it just happens to be the numerator. Okay, so the numerator is the limiting reagent. In this case, uh, this is a di iodine pentoxide. That means I take the number of limiting reagent, okay, and I convert that into the number of excess reagent. React it. How? I multiply that in the ratio. For each two units of this, I take with it 10 units of nitrogen monoxide. This times that gives you the number of nitrogen monoxide molecules that have reacted in the process 980. This is the amount that I had in the beginning. So I take that, subtract this from it, I have exactly 100 units left. Units is nothing but the molecule. But this is the flow of these kind of uh, exercises. I hope you see that, and uh, hopefully uh, that will not be too hard for now. <laughs> okay, so let's do something else. Let's take this knowledge that we have and apply it to an actual problem. <coughs> so uh, the problem of exploring cars. So we've seen it many times in the movies. We've seen it explored left and right. You can't watch a movie these days without the car, right? It seems like it is extremely easy to realize. You take a car and explode. Let's <laughs> so see if it's really is that easy. Okay? What happens in this process is there's a chemical reaction. What is exploding? Gasoline. What is gasoline? Mostly captain. That's captain. And it reacts with oxygen. That's the arrow it should go to the right and it generates C2 O and H2O. Sorry, uh, CO2 and H2O. This is a combustion reaction, and it's balanced for you already. So when does this explosion happen? It happens when this ha this, you know, the meeting of O2 with heptane is very efficient. So if these chemicals are present in the right proportion, they can very actively react and explode. Okay. If there's not enough oxygen or not enough heptane, then the chemicals have to wait until that they meet, and that means it slows down the process and means less explosive. Okay. So what I really want is I want this reaction to be complete. I want the reagents to be present in the right proportions for optimum, optimum reactive conditions. That's a long way of saying that what I need is for each one mole of heptane, I need 11 moles of oxygen. Right? That's what I want in my tank. 
So let's, let's look at that. Here's a tank. Typical tank is about 14 gallons, converted immediately to metric units, about 40, <laughs> about 53 liters. This is a very bad calculation. But let's make it the night number, 53 liters is the approximate volume of a typical gas tank. The density of heptane, we'll need that, is this number right here, given in grams per mil. And the density of oxygen is also given. Remember, oxygen is a gas. Okay, so that is 22.4 liters per mole. And here's the reaction once again. So what do I need? Well, I just said it. What you want to do is you want to have quantities of oxygen and heptane that are correct for reacting explosively. That means 11 moles of oxygen for each one mole of heptane. So the ratio needs to be 11. Okay. Now let's see intuitively you would think, you would think uh, this is what your first guess would be. I need as much heptane as possible for the best explosion charge. Let's completely fill the tank. Okay? So let's do that. Let's assume the tank is completely full. Because I think in that case, more heptane means bigger explosion. So 53 liters, that's the whole thing. Tank, it's all full of heptane now. Uh, how many moles of heptane is that? Let's calculate that. 53 times the density converts a volume into a mass, right? So I'm going to multiply this by this number here. This is the density, 0.684 grams per milliliter or kilograms per liter. Remember, grams per milliliter is the same unit as kilograms per liters. It has, has the same, it has the same value of the density. The value of density is the same expressed in kilograms per liter or grams per milliliter. So you can use that, and uh, that's helpful because this is liter times liter, so this crosses out. Now you have the mass of heptane in the tank. Okay, if the mass expressed in kilograms, I can express mass in moles by dividing by mole mass. Okay? So watch out if you do that correctly. Uh, usually the mole mass is given in grams per mole, okay? But now I do it in kilograms per mole. So that means you divide it by a thousand. Kilogram per kilogram will cross out, and what you get is moles of heptane. Same calculation like we did. You have, a, you have a mass, you divide it by mole mass. The mass is on kilograms, divided by the mole mass <coughs> expressed in kilograms per mole. Heptane is about 100 grams per mole, that means it's 0.1 kilograms per mole. I find 3.6 times 10 to the second mole of heptane. So this is the amount of heptane that I have. All right? Okay, so I need, relative to heptane, I need 11 times more oxygen for this reactor to happen. Well, the problem is, I don't have any oxygen because the tank is full. There is no oxygen to react with. Okay? The tank is completely full. There is really no oxygen that can efficiently get to the heptane. It's not in the same place. This is a fuse through the pipe that is, that's, that's far out. Okay? There's no oxygen there for all the molecules of heptane to react with. So this is absolutely not the situation of the If you're if you gas into school, you're very sick. You will not explode. You can try it for yourself, you can take the car, drive off the place on the beach, and you can see, boom, explode. Make sure you jump out before it falls. <laughs> so what we need, okay, what we need is we need more oxygen. Okay, we need more oxygen to, to do this because this reaction needs oxygen. No oxygen is present yet, so I need to get some heptane out and put some oxygen in. Okay, so let's assume the following. Let's say I have only one liter of heptane in my tank, and let's assume for all intents and purposes that the air is 100% oxygen, which is not true. Okay, well, let's just assume that that's the best thing. One liter of heptane in tank, one liter, I do the same calculation, I want to see how many moles are there. One liter times the density <coughs> give, gives me mass. Mass divided by mole mass gives me moles. I complete this calculation. I find 6.8 moles of heptane. That is the quantity of heptane. 
And now I need to you know, see how many moles of oxygen we have. So let us, let's see. If this is one mole of heptane, the tank is a total of 53. So that means 52 liters is oxygen. And I assume now, again, all the air is oxygen. It's not sure if it's 20%. Right? So, but let's just do that. So what I do now, I convert liters directly to mole because I have this conversion here. 22.4 liters per mole. So if I multiply 52 liters by this conversion factor, if I put liters at the bottom and mole on top, I directly convert to mole. I find 2.3 moles of oxygen. So 52 liters, 52 liters of oxygen gas apparently is 2.3 moles. Well, to do the division in 2.3 moles by 6.8 moles of heptane, it's 0.33. I need 11. This is not even close. Okay, so even in a situation where I have 100% oxygen in the air, <coughs> one liter of heptane in my tank won't explode. Okay? Very, very unlikely. So when actually does it explode? I want this thing to explode. Right? I'm not giving up. So I'm going to take almost all the heptane out of the tank. Okay? Let's just say that I, you know, the tank is almost completely filled with oxygen. That means 53 liters is now oxygen. So I'm going to convert how many moles that is. The same calculation. 53, this conversion factor from up here, this one at the bottom, this on top, gives me 2.4 moles of oxygen. So I have 2.4 moles of oxygen in my tank. How much heptane do I need to make this fully react? Again, under the assumption there's 100% oxygen in the air. Okay, well, the ratio needs to be 1 to 11. Okay, 1 to 11. So, what we need is 2.4 moles of oxygen. I take the ratio of oxygen at the bottom, 11 moles of oxygen for each one mole of heptane. So, effectively, I divide this thing by 11. Okay, this here is the number of moles of heptane. Okay, I multiply that by the molar mass, that means how many grams. I have, so this is the mass of heptane, okay? And then I'm going to, to multiply that by, oops, let's see, by this density conversion. So I convert uh, the mass into volume. I divide it by the density. So I do three conversions here. First, from number of oxygen to number of heptane that I need, moles of heptane converted into grams of heptane, and then mass, grams, converted into volume through the density. I divide by the density. You see, grams at the bottom will cross out, and you get now your answer in milliliters. 32 milliliter of heptane. 32 milliliter is about a quarter, sorry, a one eighth of a cup. One eighth of a cup is what you need approximately to have 2.4 moles of oxygen react explosively with Okay, so that is basically what it says. You need a small film of gasoline on your tank to make that thing explode. And then you also need about 20% oxygen in the air. Then you can have a very, very strong explosion. Turn. So, less is better, less is better. All right, so this is, this is an example of calculation. It uses mole ratios. It also uses things like this, volumes, Densities, right? These are things we've seen in the first part of this, of this uh, class. In the beginning of the first, first couple of lectures, we're all about densities, and volumes, and so forth. This is a real life situation. You could do these calculations for yourself with the tools that we've talked about. One more question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, hold on a second. There's a nice question here, okay? The question is, why does it explode in the movie? Well, first of all, in the movie, of course, they put sticks of dynamite in the tank to make it explode. Right? But, but cars can explode. And typically, cars do explode when you have a leak, and stuff drips on the floor. There's a small film with oxygen, and then it's hard to set it up. And typically, in the tank itself, you won't have conditions for explosion. Okay. Whoa!